Hi, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to my weekly podcast about spirituality, love, death, devotion, and waking up while living in a messy world. The Satsang with Shambhavi podcast is recorded live each week with students of our nonprofit community, Jayakula. For more information and to find out about attending a satsang, visit jayakula.org. Thanks for listening. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. This is a story that is actually a teaching story. Some things like this may have happened, but it's a kind of a story that's told in direct realization traditions. Virgin, different versions of this story are told. So here's one that I heard, one version of it. Some of you have heard me tell this before. There's a student of a teacher who's a direct realization teacher, a crazy wisdom teacher. I think this was told to me as this was a Taoist teacher, but you'll also hear stories like this in Dzogchen traditions and tantric traditions from India. So this is a, the Taoist version that I heard. And this student was very accomplished. He was the heart son of the teacher, of the guru, meaning the one who was inheriting supposedly all of the teacher's accomplishment and would go on to teach after the teacher died. That's what it means, a heart son or a heart daughter. And so this student had never been to his teacher's house, ever. And one day the teacher invited him over for dinner. The student was, you know, oh my God, you know, I've been studying with this teacher for 20 years and I've never had dinner at his house. He was very, very excited. So he bought a gift and he got all dressed up. And he went he, to the teacher's house and he knocked on the door. And he heard some weird sounds coming from inside, some shuffling and stumbling around. And the teacher sort of opened up the door a little bit and said, Ah, it's you! And he smelled alcohol in his teacher's breath, and he was absolutely shocked. And then the teacher opened the door a little more, and the whole place was just completely a mess, with like liquor bottles everywhere, and stuffed out cigarettes, and just a wreck. And, and the student just thought, oh my god, have I made a mistake? Have I been following the wrong teacher? This is, I just can't believe that this is how my, my beloved guru lives. And then from in the back, in the kitchen, you saw a woman popping out. She was, you know, back there making dinner. Hey! Hey, welcome! And, you know, he was like, then, that was it. He was just completely pissed off, thinking that his teacher just lied to him and, and tricked him. Into the thing. Now he thinks the teacher doesn't have any realization. And so he comes into the house, but he's just obviously in a state and he's very, very angry, and the teacher just looks at him and doesn't say anymore. Just gives him the stare. And in a flash, it dawns on the student that this is the teacher's greatest lesson. What is the lesson? Not, not worry about the outer shell, but the teaching is the most important. That's a relative, that's the relative lesson. What's the absolute lesson? All phenomena have total equality. And the, the aim of sadhana is to not have reactivity, thinking that one form of reality is better or more acceptable than another. This is what the teacher is trying to use. Crazy wisdom technique, shock therapy, uh, to shock his student into realizing that he still had this reactivity. He was still carrying these concepts about how a spiritual person should live. The teacher was like wringing him out like this cloth, right? Now, here's another question. I've never asked you guys. Some of you have heard this story before, but here's another question. Why are you assuming that's how the teacher actually lives? <laughs> right. <laughs> you mean that he might have set it up on purpose? Yeah, why don't you think he might have set it up? What stops you from thinking that? Oh, I thought he did. I always thought he did, yeah. I did too. You think that he doesn't live like that? No. This is all a setup. Yeah. I'm not to that degree. I always thought it was a setup. Hmm. 
Did you think it was a setup? I thought either one could be true. Either mm-hmm. one could be true. Yeah. Good. I didn't think about it. You didn't think about it. It seems like thinking it's a setup will trap the student again in the purity. Mm-hmm. I don't know if other people think so. Is that, do you think that's true? I think, I mean, there does seem to be like a natural desire or like a natural trajectory towards subtlety. Like when I think about Ma, you know, like she played with all these things. Like she wasn't, she would drink a puddle on the floor, but she also had extremely refined, beautiful taste too. So I think like, I don't know, depending on, you know, if the, the guru was like totally realized and didn't care at all and had total oneness, one-pointedness. But it does seem like there, are, there there's like useful... There's, there are things that are, seem to be useful about you know, being clean or not being intoxicated or whatever that people also naturally do at some point along the path. I feel like it's about possibilities, like kind of like feeling that anything is possible and you don't. That's why I thought it was both of this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what is the job of the teacher? To show you your limitations. That's one part of the job, yep. To show you your true nature. Mm -hmm. To show you your limitations, what's blocking you from Mm -hmm. discovering your real nature, and to show you your real nature. And what will the teacher do in order to show you those things? Anything. (laughs) Anything. Within this kind of tradition. So can you ever assume that you know why the teacher is doing something if you're trying to judge it on this level? No. Where should your focus be? On yourself. It doesn't really matter why the teacher is doing something. That's right. The focus isn't on why the teacher is doing something. What is the real, you know, is the teacher really this or really that or not this or not Mm -hmm. that. The focus is on me, what's going on with me. This is a mature attitude for students in a tantric tradition, a tantric householder tradition. What are the limits of that? Zongsar Kensei Rinpoche says there's no limits, right? With the, the he says that Sogyal Rinpoche was a Vajrayana te- is a Vajrayana teacher and even though he did things uh, like uh, insisting that students take videos of themselves having sex and give them to him and hitting people, like literally punching people, he says that once you take initiation with a Vajrayana teacher, that's it. You don't get to say whether something's right or wrong. What do you think about I think the limit is the capacity of the teacher and the student. Like, are they doing that, like, for reals as part of their practice, or is it fantasy? But if in a Vajrayana or tantric tradition, you're not supposed to be making those judgments about the teacher. This is what Sansara Kensei says. Well, but the student has to make those judgments about themselves, Mm -hmm. you know? What, What would be the question? Um, of the student to themselves. Am I digesting this or is this digesting me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Am I we learning from this what is the or result? not? What yeah. is the result of this, of working with this teacher in this way? Right. I mean, it makes me think of your stories about working with your teacher and how you were digesting that even when he was doing shitty things mm-hmm. and other people weren't. And so I feel like it, the same teacher, the same behavior for different students is different. Where does the power actually lie? With the student. With a student who has devotion and clarity. Mm -hmm. Not with any old student. Some students do get digested by those situations, right? So then they lose, they don't have the power in those situations. Because they can't, they don't have the clarity or the devotion to be able to digest those situations. What is a devotion to? What does devotion do? What is it to? What are, oh. Let's say you have a teacher who does things that, from an ordinary perspective, aren't good. And let's say, 
for instance, the teacher, uh, you know, actually doesn't have the right to be a crazy wisdom teacher. There's there's teachers out there saying I'm a crazy wisdom teacher, but they're not. And then they're just like doing these things to, you know, like. Sakya Mipa Rinpoche. He's an ordinary meditation teacher. He's an Upaya teacher. He's not a guru. He's calling himself a Vajrayana teacher. And he's sleeping with a lot of students and, you know, pulling a lot of crap. So, what about that situation? You know, who could benefit from that? People who can. There might be some people who could benefit from that, right? But it would have to be the most extraordinary student, not the worst students. Right. Mm -hmm. One question I've always had about Most people cannot benefit from that, right? (laughs) Let me just be clear. (laughs) Uh One question I've always had about that story is kind of um, what the teacher had taught the student about their lineage and... Did he lie to the student and say he That's was a very yeah. good point, and that's actually that getting to the next part of the quiz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're in a Vajrayana or Tantric tradition or direct realization tradition, uh, then we don't have these kind of rules about celibacy and uh, you know taking vows and things like that. But what if your teacher is a monk? What if your teacher is a renunciate? What if your teacher is not in a Vajrayana lineage and is discovered breaking their own vows? What do you think about that? I think they're creating like a container with their vows to, for students to work within and to constantly be breaking that. It doesn't, I mean, if you're not, with, if you're not in the context of a tantric type tradition, those, that foundation is important and useful for people, so I just don't feel like it's, it doesn't seem fundamentally helpful. It seems more like lying, yeah. like they yeah. lie to themselves, and getting mm-hmm. yeah. themselves into that position, like that's not mm-hmm. the right thing for them to be mm-hmm. and then to be teaching others. Pema Chodron in that article says that um, Chodron Trimpa really was very um, insistent that she keep to her vows. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just sounded good to me that mm-hmm. it was. What do you think China is? I, I started my path when I was 17 from the Swami, Swami Kriyananda, mm-hmm. who was the founder of Ananda. Mm-hmm. And so I idealized him. I saw him on TV for six months. And when I came to know that a bunch of scandals had already mm-hmm. passed five years ago, ten years ago, I, he had said that he had consensual sex and whatnot, and the women wanted money, and all of that had been settled. It was still very heartbreaking for me. Mm-hmm. I asked some monks at Nanda in India, how do you learn from him now? Like, mm-hmm. But then I was like trying to look into my own heart, and satsangs were still very touching to me. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is the teacher that now I have a problem with, because I know these things, but I'm loving the satsangs. Uh, I asked my other teacher too, the young guy in California who, who was an Indian, and he's, he just told me to relax that. And then I was able to relax that and enjoy my time in Ananda, which was maybe two years mm-hmm. after, from then. But it's heartbreaking to see that the vows were broken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that? It feels like the teacher has to have integrity to something. So if they're breaking those vows, is it, uh, there could be some situation where they're having integrity to something else, mm-hmm. some sort of inner vow or something, but I don't know. It, well, my feeling is that one should stick, one should protect the integrity of one's tradition at all costs. Right? That if you're in a tradition, where a certain external form of renunciation is required, or where taking certain kinds of vows is actually the foundation of the tradition, or, you know, doing nandra or something like that, that that's your tradition, and as a teacher, it's your job to 
faithfully represent that tradition, whatever it is. And that if you don't, you, you shouldn't be a teacher in that tradition. That's my opinion. Every tradition has integrity of some sort or another, based on something. It, you know, it might not be vows and, and external renunciation, but it might be something else. Whatever it is, one should try to uphold that. So Zangsar Kensei Rinpoche thinks that a Vajrayana teacher should be able to do anything and students should, shouldn't complain. Anything, including murder, he said. What do you think of that? Is he talking about the students who have, like, decided or, you know, they know... Yeah, that students that who have taken there. Samaya Diksha. Okay, so that's their Sorry, teacher. qualification. Yeah. Students <laughs> who have taken Samaya Diksha, not just any old person that they should expect anything and not complain, that they've already signed on, they know what they were signing on for, and that's that. Can you ever really know what you're signing on for? Yeah. That's right. That's a very, very smart question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the teacher, if the teacher has accomplishment, the teacher knows more about what you're signing yeah. on for than you no. do. <laughs> The teacher won't demand something from you that you don't feel right about at some level. At like, some like, level. Like, some dying, level. like dying at a certain moment where the teacher is murdering you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like you will not have an, a compass about that. Mm -hmm. so, on like a bigger level, it makes me, that sort of thing makes me think about ultimately being able to learn and work with reality, like totally, you know, like murders happen in reality. Mm -hmm. Like if the universe, like wisdom itself is your guru, you do, I imagine, find a way to work with all circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I like, I agree with what was just said, but I do feel like that is the ultimate goal. So if that was, if you could digest it and the teacher had great accomplishment, then you would learn no matter what they did, you would, you would be contacting wisdom in a super deep way. But I would not like to be murdered. <laughs> <laughs> so how many students yeah, exactly. exist that actually exist? Yeah, very few. Yeah. And that's a good point, too, because teachers with actual accomplishment have to learn, well, first of all, they don't want to do any harm. I mean, no, no teacher who's really on the path in a non-self-deceptive -de way, uh, wants to harm students. <laughs> so, you know, even though I'm not enlightened and I don't have consummate skill, I do not want to harm anyone. And part of that non-harming is that it doesn't is that you have to try to figure out where students are. Mm -hmm. I mean, not in an intellectual way, but you're just kind of feeling. I, I would never ask any of you to jump off a cliff the way that has been reported, you know, about Babaji, the avatar, or something like that. I mean, I'm not an avatar, so luckily I know that. Or not everyone does. <laughs> and I, I realize it's not within my skill set to ask people to jump off cliffs and kill themselves. I can't resurrect you. And I can't guarantee yeah. what would happen to you after you did that. So I wouldn't do that. But on a more real level, um, you know, there's th you have to sort of feel your way with a student who's taken some addiction. What is it they can handle and what is it they can't handle? Right? And, and try your best not to ask people to do things that they can't handle. That should be at the very edge of what you can handle. It should sort of be, here's what you think you can handle. Here's what you can't handle. And that's where the teacher is working. <laughs> in the sun tea. Right, in the sun tea between what you, the line that you've drawn in the sand yeah. and the actual line. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's a, a very subtle thing. 
there are many ranges of students who have taken Samaya Diksha, I mean, all over the world, not just to Jaipula, with different ranges of capacities and different teachers with different ranges of capacities teaching them. So there's very, very few teachers, if any, that could commit murder and have it really be an act of non-dual compassion. I don't know how often that happens. Probably hardly ever. Yeah. Maybe like once in a millennium. Right? Um, it feels like it's nearly impossible to even answer that kind of question right. unless you're that student in that relationship with that That's teacher. Right. That's right. Or that teacher That's right. themselves. Or that teacher themselves. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. But it's yeah. a good thought exercise mm -hmm. um, because it helps us to understand what the student-teacher relationship actually is and what our role is and to be you know humble about that and so that we can make we can be discerning mm -hmm. right? both teachers and students have to be discerning about what they want and what is what is something that they can do together and what is not what they can do together some of the, those recent stories of uh, the Satyam Wimpong's behavior um, and the, the students who were abused by him. Um, it seems like one of the hardest things for people to have discernment about is, I mean, maybe especially women, is whether uh, whether this is basically a loving whether this is basically about love and wanting the best for me or, or about harm, you know, the difference between a caring you know, a basically caring relationship and a harmful relationship mm -hmm. um, it's kind of amazing how hard it is to discern between those two mm -hmm. discernment happens with all your senses not just with your intellect. You can't treat it like a Chinese menu, you know, with your like column A and column B of points. It's not like that. You have to be able to feel what's really going on between you and the teacher in order to really be discerning. I, I just when you were talking I was thinking about Ma's she asks something three times and then she lets it go. But if you say yes three times, then you're in trouble. <laughs> That's a very non-coercive way of working with people, right? Mm -hmm. she, I don't. I mean, this is a ridiculous thing. But if she said, "I have sex with me three times," this, you know, if some people would say no the first time, some people would say no the second time, some people would say no the third time. But if she wouldn't press them after that, right? It's really uh, affirmative consent. <laughs> It's affirmative consent, you know, like making sure that that's there. And, and, and that's a very literal example, but there's all yeah. kinds of ways that teachers, including myself, test students by asking a certain kind of question or suggesting something. You know, I often work by suggestion, as many of you know. I, and, you know, if someone says yes but doesn't follow through or says, I'll think about it, or says no... I don't really suggest again until some later date. <laughs> or maybe never, it depends. Um, but there's lots of ways in which teachers try to you know, put the thermometer in and test where the student is and where they're willing to go and what they're willing to do. And I think a respectful teacher will not um, go any further than that if the answer is no. And I think it's possible to feel when you're being uh, pressured, right? In an unhealthy way. I mean, you know, I can't, I don't know what the Sakyam did, but you know, I can imagine if someone protested and then you start arguing with somebody. I mean, that's not a good sign. <laughs> right? 
what I thought of when you said that laundry was that um, I think it's hard as women to have that discernment sometimes between what's an actual caring relationship and what's not because I know for me I didn't I didn't see or like feel any of those caring relationships um, until I was much older you know so without any sort of um, uh, guidepost you know I think that discernment is a lot harder yeah and if you think you're Worthless, um, mm-hmm. kind of the, the way Han, Hannah Gab, Gatsby was saying in her, um, her performance. You know, she thought she was worthless for a long time, so. but now she doesn't. Right. So, th- this is something that I've said to people from my former Kula, who have come to me about my former teacher and some of the things that he did and how he manipulated them or made him feel made them feel. And I said, yeah, but now you see it. When you first came, you didn't see it. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Something good happened, <laughs> mm-hmm. even though it was painful. We have, to, we have to grow, and sometimes we have to go through very painful situations in order to have more clarity. That's very, very common. It's just the way the world works. <laughs> In fact, sometimes in the course of working with teachers, they'll teach, uh, they'll put you in a very painful situation on purpose. Not, not I don't mean sexually manipulating, but some other painful situation, so that you'll feel your real condition. Because this is a big problem when we have a lot of karmic fixation. We, we're using it to buffer ourselves from feeling our real situation, our real emotions, how we really are. That has we have, we have to start with feeling ourselves. We have to be willing to feel ourselves. And sometimes that takes a lot of heavy lifting. In certain cases. <laughs> Is there anything else about this that you want to talk about? Going up what Nirvana is up to, I think the power imbalance, like when somebody has the robes and they have the thing and they have the, the song and dance around them, even if you don't feel worthless, like there is, for a lot of people, I think some comfort in that. It's like, well, mm-hmm. this person has power for a reason. Like a lot of people think mm-hmm. that they're realized or that they're helping them in some way or whatever. And it's mm-hmm. like, without clarity or without, yeah, like being able to feel and see and touch mm-hmm. in a discerning way like what's really going on it's I think it's just easier and easier when there's all these different dynamics at play and mm-hmm. someone is kind of banking on that to manipulate people so this is the relative experience yeah. Yeah. right the absolute experience is that all of these circumstances are God mm-hmm. all of these circumstances are brought about mm-hmm. as part of that play of waking up so there you know ultimately there's really not anything to but, of course, the process of worrying about it is part of our sadhana. It's part of how we play this game. But ultimately, every one of those circumstances has some wisdom in it or some benefit to it. How do we know that? I know that some of you don't know that, but I'm, I just want to know, do you have even an intellectual idea of how we might come to know that, for reals. Come to know the wisdom? Come to know that every circumstance, even the really terrible ones, is has benefit. Well, there's the example of people who get cancer and years later say getting cancer was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, the wisdom that comes. Sure. But, but even having said that, there's some line you're going to draw. You know, if we're just thinking in that way, a relative way, there's some line we're going to draw, like, you know, children starving yeah. or something, you know, that where it's like absolutely terrible, there's nothing redeeming about it. We're going to we're gonna draw a line with that kind of thinking, which is fine because we are living in the relative, but if we're not living in the relative, how would we have, get 
confidence? How do we even discover that everything is beneficent? Practice. Well, then what would happen? You can just what think, would happen with yeah. practice? What, yeah, you would just no. You would like have have an experience, like know intuitively that it. it's that even if you don't actually know what it is trying to communicate, <laughs> it's trying mm-hmm. to communicate some type mm-hmm. of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Why do you know that? It's just the way it works. I don't know. I can see how when you start to really feel that uh, that what's out there is the same as what's in here, that mm-hmm. you know, that you could feel that about anything. Mm-hmm. That that it's all the same energy. Mm-hmm. And I feel like it starts happening more and more with practice. Like I could like. Like I asked a question internally, like for you to talk about fierceness, and then I'm like, all, all you have, like I feel like a lot of what I learn is like just have patience and wait, and like even if I don't speak it out loud, like the answer will come in the next few days. Like it'll just not all, it's but it's, it's just always beautiful the call and response, like how alive that is when you have an experience of that more. Mm-hmm. So first of all, you start to have an experience of things being alive. Everything. Right? That's, that's the beginning. But at some point, you're going to have a very definite, palpable experience of the goodness and beneficence of everything. It will be more than just an intuition. It will be an all-encompassing experience. And that's something that we have to... relax a lot to feel but it is when we go deeper in presence that's what we encounter we encounter not just liveliness but we encounter that goodness that compassion that wisdom and it's everywhere it's all encompassing there's nothing outside of it so that one continuous fundament of our existence is goodness without its opposite it is just goodness is just wisdom. So we need to have that experience, which starts with transmission and feeling the liveliness of things, and deepens and deepens as we go along in our practice. Even you can find it just in your practice in little bits. You can feel the goodness in yourself, center of your heart space, you can feel something like the generosity and basic goodness of transmission. When you're experiencing transmission, it doesn't feel questionable, like, oh, I don't know if this is good or not. This could be bad. (laughs) You know, it's, it's, it's relaxing, or it's energizing, but it has that quality of the basic goodness and helpfulness of everything. So you can try to make contact with that and recognize it. It's not enough to just have some sort of physical sensory experience. You have to recognize what it is you're experiencing. You have to engage, you have to meet it. Just say, hi, let me see who you are. (laughs) (laughs) And then as counterintuitive, it's actually counterintuitive that that babies being ripped from their moms could be made of wisdom and beneficence. That's counterintuitive. And it takes a very long time in my experience to gain enough confidence in that experience of goodness to really have that be your, your base at the same time that we don't stop feeling things like sorrow or grief when things happen that naturally cause grief and sorrow. We don't, we don't, we feel grief and sorrow at the movies. 
We just have emotions. We will always have emotions. But you're just okay with it? Is that yeah. the difference? You're just okay with it. Okay. You're not trying to like fight it. And you're not trying to fight it, but you're you're not trying to accept it either. It's actually enjoyable. Sorrow is enjoyable? Sure. Okay. Oh, even in an ordinary way. That's true. Okay. <laughs> if sorrow weren't enjoyable, you wouldn't be so sad. That's true. <laughs> I'm not saying it's only enjoyable, but the, there's a at least a kernel in there of enjoyment of all of our fixations. Otherwise, we wouldn't have them. Because <laughs> we are creatures of enjoyment. Why are we creatures of enjoyment? Because it's God quiz night. Does. That's what God does. Because that's what Lord Shiv is doing, enjoying everything. So our own weird enjoyment of even things that feel bad is an echo or, or a key or a clue right, to the nature of reality. Why, if everything is so terrible, why do we go to the movies and see more terrible things? Why do we pay to see babies kidnapped, babies falling into drain drainage holes, <laughs> you know, babies abandoned, babies, whatever. Why do we why do we pay to see terrible things? This is a very odd thing. Like if you step back, if you have your like sort of ordinary view of things, murder is terrible, war is terrible, baby suffering is terrible, starvation is terrible, torture is terrible, etc. etc. All these things are just terrible, unredeemed, evil, horrible. So Sarah, it's all about suffering. And then you plunk down your nine bucks at the movies to go see war and mayhem and destruction. <laughs> oh, this is fun. This isn't terrible. <laughs> I mean, it is very, very weird. I never quite cracked that argument or that. Well, it's even like the Mahabharata. Like, yeah. you figure when it was a beautiful story and people would story tell, you know, like that, they didn't have movie theater. They had someone telling yeah. them this graphic heads being chopped off. But you know, it's a story. There. But there's still enjoyment in the grossness or the graphicness of like you know things that are considered bad. If 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 destruction of varying kinds is really terrible, it's just really terrible. Why would we want to see more of it, even if it's just a story? Maybe it sort of relieves the tension somehow that, that we have in experiencing those things, but if we go to a theater we get to watch it as a story and, and that sort of releases some tension mm -hmm. It does seem like there's a way to feel it though, to feel the enjoyment of misery and feel the enjoyment of pining and feel, you know, it doesn't have to be mental it's like, mm -hmm. there, I actually when personally, I actually feel the enjoyment aspect of being an asshole or being super... Oh, yeah, being an asshole is <laughs> yeah. very enjoyable. Yeah. Like, you can really feel it. Yearning like, is enjoyable. Yeah, everything is enjoyable. I feel like there are some things that maybe just I'm not able to digest it that I don't like to see. Like, I was watching something and, like, this guy's eyes got sliced Ugh. with his yeah. knife, like, I right across it. the front and, like, yeah. just, like, really violent action yeah. movies. Mm -hmm. Like, some of it I don't like to see because I don't want the images going yeah. through my head again and again. Yeah. Yeah, I hate that. In, in that sense, or like those like super gory um, zombie movies with yeah. like guts coming those. out everywhere, but I it's just like those are funny. They're a lot of times You're but if you've seen a yeah. super no, I mean, hardcore no, one. Yeah. <laughs> Magic, could you take this no, yeah. like, yeah. like, like those Do you want it wet and or no, really so. things I don't like to watch. Like I could never watch the show The Wire. I watched like part of it and it was too real. Like seeing them recruit nine year old boys and having the boys go up to someone and point blank like, shoot somebody in the head in a grocery store. Like, that stuff actually happens, and I just didn't want to watch it. Well, my favorite yeah. example is the World Trade Towers getting bombed. Mm. It was telepathic. Yeah, when people, everyone 
everyone stopped everything and watched it. Again, yeah. again, and again. And again. I mean, so what about that and car crashes on the road? Because it had this incredibly aesthetic yeah. component. Yeah, definitely. Right? It was like theater on a massive scale. It was beautiful on some level. It was level. majestic. It was majestic. too, of what it meant for the country yeah. and the world. But there's also the feeling of, of awe and horror, yeah. and it's like feeling that again. Mm-hmm. You know? and a little so bit it's not just the movies, it's not just when it's a story. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I thought like about this one website I found in like the early 2000s or something. I was like, are there any people that really just choose to never watch those types of things? And there was one really Christian, like super fundamentalist Christian website that was like, reviews of these movies just so Christians wouldn't accidentally take their children to them. And then mm-hmm. I had a thought the next second about the Bible. It's like, instead of watching these horrible movies, yeah. read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wait, wait a minute. It's yeah. worse than the Mahabharata. <laughs> like, that's what yeah. they're directing everyone to. Yeah. I occasionally watch footage from the tsunami mm-hmm. in Japan. Right. It's absolutely beautiful and fascinating and like awesome like it's just yeah. that classical feeling of awe like at what our world is capable of yeah. or volcanoes yeah. Yeah. natural disasters yeah. for sure mm-hmm. and in an ordinary way too I feel like because I don't you know I don't feel like I have this enlightened connection to these things but I do I have been trying to just like rock the fact with like the Trump administration like this is what is happening. It is the way it is. Like, I spent decades in opposition to it as if that did anything for it not to just fundamentally be, have been created by reality in some way. Wait, could you repeat that? Like, I just feel like it's like, the, is, the fundamental isness of the way things are, no matter how we feel about them or if we, if everybody was capable of rallying against them and changing them, like, sometimes I feel like it's kind of good to feel powerless because you have to just deal with with the fact that that is the way it is right now, mm-hmm. and one person can't really do enough to fi- to change it or fix it or whatever, and it's like you really just have to be in awe of how much struggle and strife and misery there is, and wonder like, or wonder about it. Mm-hmm. No matter how much you're pushing it away, but this is wrong and bad, and I can't handle it or I refuse to acknowledge that it is happening on some level. I feel like people do that. On the other hand, that's true. And it's good to, I mean, we all are relatively powerless. On the other hand, you know, a single person with a lot of realization can affect a lot of change. I mean, not change like in this, we're progressing up the ladder of change, but There, there is change. There's yeah. constant change, and it goes in a certain way. And if we all do a lot of practice and realize we can be real actors, players, rather than as I'm glad when you said we can be players rather than the played. And that's a lot of fun, and it's also very fulfilling to be able to help people be more free. It's also fulfilling just to be able to love people and forget about helping them. It's, <laughs> it's fulfilling just to be able to love without so many restrictions. It's fulfilling to be able to give. And in order to be able to give, we have to be more free of our karmic tensions. This is, I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of times in history when people like us have said, this is a pivotal moment in history. Yeah. So I am a little bit skeptical of myself, but yeah. <laughs> I do feel there's Mahabharata-ness afoot. We do have social media too, which I feel like has really, really changed mm-hmm. like the visibility of certain things and the instantaneousness of things like that in and of itself has created a different feeling, you know, versus like getting the newspaper on a Sunday and being like, you know, so many more people can be reporting so many more things and be aware of it. 
anything else on this? Can one get desensitized by watching violence on TV? Like, I, I watch a lot of Game of Thrones in the last three weeks, I think. <laughs> like, Arya Stark would murder somebody, and then she would see a smile on her face. And she's like a 16 year old, so after a while of watching all this, I have started to enjoy blood coming out of the neck and things, which I wouldn't have imagined. I would like that. <laughs> could, could one get desensitized? I guess that's true, but I, you could also be sensitized to the aesthetics of something, right? The color, the movement, the, this, the feeling. You know, there's things you could get sensitized to also. The creativity of, you know, killing this one in a different way. <laughs> that happened to me when I was watching Game of Thrones. I was like, ooh, it's creative. 